With two weeks to go before Donald Trump's inauguration, we're getting a sense of how policy will shape up under America's 45th president. And it leaves many analysts worrying about Ontario's economic interests. This week, Ford announced it is scrapping plans for an auto assembly plant in Mexico and instead will create 700 new jobs in Michigan. In an America first trade policy, where might that leave our auto plants and our manufacturing industry? Let's get into this with John Ibbotson. He's the writer at large for the Globe and Mail who joins us now from our nation's capital. John, it's always good to have you back on the program. How are you doing today? Great, thanks, Steve. Not at all. Let's start with a tweet that Roland Paris put out. He's, of course, uh, University of Ottawa, foreign, former foreign policy advisor to Justin Trudeau, who said, even if Canada isn't directly targeted, there's no denying risk of collateral damage from Trump's economic policies, and stakes are high. Let's unpack that a little bit. Uh, how high do you think the stakes are for the province of Ontario in particular? Well, potentially enormously high. Uh, we don't know whether Donald Trump, in his determination to scrap the North American Free Trade Agreement, means to scrap just the re relationship between the United States and Mexico, or whether it involves Canada as well. Um, he essentially is, is saying that he wants to impose um, a 35% tariff on any company that's trying to import products into the United States from Mexico, especially cars. Um, and it's not just American companies, because that's what we initially thought was the case. American companies that offshored and then tried to bring products back in, taking advantage of lower uh, wage rates. Uh, because Toyota as well, he, he tweeted on Thursday that Toyota would not be allowed to construct a plant in Baja, Mexico, and then import Toyota Corollas into the United States. Well, of course, the question is, there's a Toyota plant in Ontario as well. So is it just Mexican imports of cars that he's targeting? Or is he planning to put up a tariff wall around the entire country and basically um, impose tariffs on anything coming into the United States, regardless of where it's from, including Canada? We're just waiting for the tweet to clarify. <laughs> waiting for the tweet to clarify. Well, our <laughs> that is how policy is made in the United States these days, isn't it? Anyway, that's another subject. <laughs> so this notion that Roland Paris refers to of collateral damage, there are people, I guess, then in Canada who are wondering whether we're going to be collateral damage to the new administration. Have I got that right? Yeah, and it's the degree of collateral damage. So let's assume uh, the best case scenario. Let's assume that the Trump administration decides that uh, NAFTA doesn't work because you have two high wage countries and one low wage country, Mexico. And so we're going to scrap NAFTA. We're going to basically put up a tariff barrier between Mexico and the United States. By the way, I think that's just a terrible idea, but let's say that's where they're going. But they agree that the Canadian economy and the American economy are you know, incredibly interlinked, that they're both high wage economies, um, and that the integration of the, of the auto industry especially uh, can continue apace. What does that mean in other areas? For example, but by American, that's a government procurement program that even under the Obama administration froze out Canadian firms that were uh, hoping to be able to bid on um, American government contracts. Or even American firms that had some production in Canada, they were being shut out. Well, one expects that under President Trump, the Buy American program could be extended in all sorts of nasty ways. And then there's softwood lumber, which is outside NAFTA, but which is up for uh, renewal, which is in negotiations. Um, you can just imagine that if President Trump is going to be even tougher on uh, softwood lumber than, um, than the previous administrations have, have already been. And there are literally hundreds of thousands of jobs at stake on, when it comes to softwood. Here's how the Washington Post reported on the big auto news of the week. Um, here we go from earlier in the week. Ford Chief Executive Mark Field said Tuesday the automaker was ditching its plans to open a factory in Mexico and instead expanding a Michigan plant, creating 700 more local jobs. Ford's move became political after Fields expressed confidence in the business climate under President-elect Donald Trump, and Trump on Twitter took credit for the company's decision. Both men invoked the importance of protecting American jobs. Okay, we get the political reasons why Ford would want to expand in Michigan as opposed to build this new plant in Mexico. Do you think there are other reasons why Ford made that decision? Well, I think everybody's trying to get on the good side of the president. Now, it doesn't matter who the president is, Republican or Democrat, um, industry wants a friendly environment for investment. There are people who believe that Ford was planning to shift that production out of Mexico and back to Michigan anyway for business reasons. But it doesn't hurt if you were going to do it anyway uh, to make it look as though uh, you were doing it at the behest of Donald Trump because anything that makes Donald Trump looks, look good is great in the eyes of Donald Trump. 
but then the question becomes, well, uh, how far does this go? How, how, to what extent are businesses making investment decisions based purely on the whims and the mood of the president? And at what point does this begin to really seriously affect the competitive, uh, competitiveness of industry? And then we get into even bigger questions like China and, um, and other areas where there could be tariffs and what that means for the f uh, future going forward. It's, it's a bit of a headache. But can you imagine that a company would make that kind of a, you know, what, what turns out to be a billion dollar decision uh, just to stay uh, out of Donald Trump's Twitter crosshairs? At the beginning, surely uh, the answer appears to be yes. But you would expect that down the road, you'd start to get pushback. These big multinational corporations would start to say, look, we, we can't make business decisions based purely on what Donald Trump is tweeting. Um, you know, Apple has, has a supply chain that goes around the world. Is he actually going to start imposing tariffs that would force Apple to, to you know, bring its manufacturing back to the United States? What would that mean for Apple? What would that mean for its profits? What would that mean for the price of an iPhone uh, on top of everything else? Uh, this is where it gets really complicated. Let's take a look at the, well, I guess what they now call the Detroit Three and their businesses in Canada and see what the implications of all of what we've been talking about have been for them. Uh, the latest developments, I guess, on that front are that all three, GM, Ford, Chrysler, have signed new union contracts in Canada in the fall. Those deals included a billion five in new investment at Canadian plants. And I wonder whether you think that means those folks can breathe a bit of a sigh of relief in as much as that is all locked in at the moment. In a rules-based economy, yes. Where you have predictability uh, at, the, at the federal government level, yes. What we don't know is whether we are going to still be in a rules-based economy or whether we're going to be in an economy, what you might call a whim-based economy, in which uh, decisions about uh, investments and tariffs and outsourcing and manufacturing and wage rates and all of that are dependent on the whims of, uh, of you know, what could be a rogue president and, uh, and, and to what extent you know, we, we can have that kind of predictability going forward or, or whether or not whether investment has to be based not on predictability at all, but just on sort of, you know, covering your rear. Um, and, and then, you know, just to complicate matters even further, you have the question of China. Um, Donald Trump believes that the Chinese manipulate their currency and do all sorts of other things um, in order to make it difficult for Americans to export into China, but easy for the Chinese to export into the United States. He's threatening a tariff um, on Chinese imports. And indeed, all of his major cabinet picks are singing from that hymn book. What happens if there are major tariffs placed on Chinese imports into the United States? Do the Chinese retaliate? by placing a tariff on American exports. What does that mean for the global economy when the world's two largest economies are in a trade war together? Does that lead to a global recession? Does this help Canada? We could maybe sign our own free trade deal, trade deal with China and sort of reap the benefits of the American wall by being outside it? Or do we get sideswiped, as Roland Paris said, in, in the midst of that trade war? It makes it very, very, I keep repeating myself, I know, but it just makes it very difficult to predict what's going to happen going forward. No, that's a lot of good questions you've asked there, but let's play the scenario forward even a little further uh, and actually reference uh, an example you gave just a couple of minutes ago where you said, let's say these big tariff walls go up on Apple and suddenly an iPhone costs 30 or or $100 more per unit. Do we have any sense about how much more a car would cost if, for example, uh, it, it had to be made entirely in the United States with only American parts and no quote unquote foreign content? I don't know the answer to that, and I don't think any prediction is reasonable because it's not just, all right, we shut down all the plants in Ontario and we source everything in the United States. Great, we get all sorts of jobs in American factories, that's good for the American economy, their consumer base expands, but the dislocation is enormous. Companies are losing billions and billions of dollars as they have to shut plants down outside the United States and move the production into the United States. That could lead to a recession in the United States itself. And uh, what would that mean for the, for the price of a car, whether it is a Buick or whether it is a Corolla? Hmm. John, I wonder if I could get you to talk about two uh, people on the American political scene who will be hugely important in the days going forward uh, that I suspect very few of our viewers have ever heard of. And I'm talking about Robert Lighthizer, who is the U.S. new, under Donald Trump, new trade representative, and Wilbur Ross, who will be, if assuming he's confirmed by the Senate, the new Commerce Secretary. What can you tell us about the mission of those two men? Well, the, the good news about Mr. Lighthizer is that he was an assistant trade representative during the 1980s when Canada and the United States 
uh, negotiated the original free trade agreement um, of 1989. So he, he knows Canada, he knows the issues, he has worked in the private sector on bilateral trade issues. So, you know, we, he doesn't need to be educated on, on the Canadian economy and the linkage between the Canadian and American economy. That's the good news. The bad news is that both gentlemen share Donald Trump's suspicion that the, United, that the Chinese are exploiting um, the United States through currency manipulation and other measures, and both of them are determined to um, impose some kind of tariff on, uh, on Chinese imports. That suggests that this wasn't just campaign rhetoric uh, that Donald Trump was spouting, like you know, building a wall and making Mexico pay for it, and we're going to punish the Chinese. It sounds like this is real, this is serious, and earlier rather than later in this administration's mandate, we're going to see some action um, being taken against China with all the risks that uh, we've already discussed. Hmm. We saw this past week as well that uh, America's new Congress, much more Republican Congress, was sworn in, all of its new members. And to that end, Canada's Prime Minister and Canada's Ambassador to Washington decided to put out a little <coughs> welcoming video. Let's play a little snippet of that and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, roll it if you would. We've built an economic relationship that supports jobs in every congressional district. We're the largest international customer for goods and services made in the USA. And not only do we buy from you, but we're also part of the world's most advanced economy. American and Canadian businesses work closely together to develop and sell our products to the world. Justin Trudeau and David McNaughton. John, any value in doing that kind of a video? Oh, I think so, for a couple of reasons. First, the Trudeau government deserves credit for this. A lot of Canadians, I think most Canadians, in fact, I think the overwhelming majority of Canadians, did not want to see Donald Trump. Uh, become president. They were appalled by his nativist, frankly, at times racist views, and they just it's, it's not an America that, that we know or, or, or welcome. And there was a great temptation for um, Mr. Trudeau to weigh in on that and to say that Donald Trump's America is not Canada's America. Um, but he didn't. He resisted it uh, because uh, he rightly expected there's a, there was a chance that Donald Trump might become president. So he hasn't blotted his copybook, as he used to say, with the administration in advance. He has already said that he's welcome to reopen NAFTA and discuss it with a view to improving it. Uh, the, uh, but the other thing that's good about that video is it recognizes the tremendous importance of Congress. Um, previous Canadian governments uh, have in the past sometimes sinned in believing that the Canada-U.S. relationship is one between the Langevin bloc in Ottawa and the West Wing in Washington, between the President and the Prime Minister. But it's not. Congress is tremendously important. And anyone who knows Canada-U.S. relations well will tell you that it is, it is as important to have the ear of senators and congressmen when it comes to things like softwood lumber or any other major issue. And so by, by directly addressing the, the incoming Congress, Mr. Trudeau is saying, we understand that where the power centers are in Washington, and we plan to, to curry good relationships with uh, both the Hill and the West Wing. Okay, fair enough. But if NAFTA is now going to be in Donald Trump's crosshairs, as he's given every indication that it will be, I wonder if you could talk to us about the importance of another trade deal that this country has, a relatively new trade deal, uh, called CETA, which is the one between us and the European Union. Does that suddenly take on more importance if NAFTA is under threat? Yeah, it certainly does, because it's part of what I think most people believe has to be the plan B. So plan A is cultivate good relations with the Trump administration. Try to renegotiate NAFTA in a way that doesn't impair Canadian interests, maybe even improve it in, in a couple of places, for example, in dispute resolution. But be prepared as well for a hostile protectionist um, uh, uh, American administration uh, that really could uh, cut off the flow of Canadian exports. In that case, the vertical relationship may be damaged, so we need to uh, improve horizontal relationships. And that means, yes, affirming the uh, Canada-European trade agreement that the Harper government negotiated and that the Trudeau government brought home. It means now that the Trans-Pacific Partnership talks are dead, that was a 12-nation Pacific um, agreement that uh, got signed but was clearly never going to be ratified. Um, can Canada get a bilateral free trade agreement with Japan, which was one of the biggest signatory, uh, one of the biggest signatories for the TPP? Can it get a free trade agreement going uh, with China? Uh, what about Singapore, which is small but nonetheless important? Where can Canada expand its uh, export opportunities throughout the Pacific region bilaterally um, in, if, in fact, we need to find an alternative places to sell our products? On the other hand, is there a danger in our... Um Maybe, maybe making too dramatic decisions about our relationship with the United States, given that 
Look, you never know. The man's 70 years old. I mean, four years from now, he might be, he might be out as president. It might be a one term and gone. Sure, but it's never a bad idea to promote trade. Canada is a trading nation. Uh, there are people in this country who believe that, that free trade is uh, a bad idea, that um, Canada should look to encouraging economic development within Canada itself. But look, we all know that this country is six cities with a whole lot of bush in between, um, <laughs> that the Canadian economy is just not large enough to sustain the kind of uh, energy production and manufacturing production uh, that generates the, the revenues that pay for the hospitals and the schools and the roads. So whatever happens in the United States, it's always a good idea for Canada to look to other markets, especially uh, Pacific markets, um, in, in the years going forward. Even with the friendliest of administrations, uh, Canada would have anyway wanted to become ever more a Pacific rather than Atlantic nation, a, a nation that trades to the West into the new growing economies of the Pacific Rim and not just into the United States. That was always going to be in our interest any Anyway, it's even more in our interest now. Hmm. I'm going uh, through my head right now on the six cities that you're... So it's Hamilton, Sudbury... No, never mind. <laughs> That's another show. We'll do that another time. John, in our last few minutes here, I want to talk about one more thing, and that is the uh, cap-and-trade plan, which went into effect at the beginning of this year. Ontario now joins a so-called cap-and-trade market with Quebec and with the state of California. So this is a, a North American thing, not just a, a, a provincial or even a Canadian thing. I wonder how you think this new cap-and-trade plan fits into all of what we've been talking about so far in terms of our economy, our competitiveness, all of that. Yeah, it's a worry. Um, for one thing, the Trump administration is vowing to reduce corporate taxes. Uh, through um, both liberal and conservative governments, Canada has steadily lowered its corporate tax rate until it's now uh, much lower than the United States rate. So if the Americans lower their corporate taxes, then that's going to affect our competitiveness. Uh, secondly, um, Donald, Tra Donald Trump is, to put it uh, gently, um, a skeptic when it comes to the issue of global warming. So we're going to see nothing at all um, at the federal level in terms of combating global warming. We just have to hope he doesn't do too much damage in terms of permitting cold fire generation to ramp back up. I don't think the market would encourage that anyway, uh, or any other measures that, that he, might, he might pursue. So you could argue that Canada should scrap its plans to go uh, with the car national carbon tax in all but name, because the Americans aren't going to have one, and therefore uh, it's going to even further harm our competitiveness. On the other hand, global warming is real. Uh, we, you know, everyone needs to do something about it, including us. And as you pointed out, American states are moving, even if the American federal government isn't. So, the, the, and this is going to require some very clever stick handling on the part of the Canadian government, and by the way, uh, the Ontario and British Columbia and Alberta governments as well. What can we do to sort of interlace uh, or intersect with actions that are taking place at the state level to combat global warming without, be, without moving to a point where we do become seriously uncompetitive, especially if, in fact, our southern trading partner becomes increasingly hostile uh, on issues of trade. Well, the fact is that, uh, you know, as soon as people see their heating bills in their homes, th they are going to go up a little bit uh, as a result of this new cap-and-trade plan. As soon as people have to go to the gas pumps to gas up, they are going to notice I think it's, what, four cents a liter or something like that more in cap-and-trade fees. Uh, you know, I don't want to get into a discussion about the political advisability of doing so, but given what Trump plans uh, stateside, if you were advising the Ontario government about its plan, uh, what would you tell them as it relates to how hard to go on this cap-and-trade? Well, I think I'd tell them to be careful. Um, what we need to see is evidence or lack thereof that investment is actually flowing out of Ontario or out of British Columbia or out of Quebec and into other jurisdictions, especially, especially the United States, because our energy rates have become uncompetitive. If there is you know, real evidence that we are losing jobs in this country because we are not competitive with the United States um, in terms of taxes, in terms of energy costs, then we have to fix that. We just have to. The Canadian economy cannot be that far out of whack with the American economy in terms of competitiveness. We're talking about jobs here. We're talking about people's lives. We're talking about the quality of the education that we give our children, the quality of health care that we give our seniors. Um, it's not just some abstract uh, notion. We need to make sure that we are a competitive economy vis-a-vis -vis the United States, and that means keeping our energy costs in line one way or another. Gotcha. That's our time. John, it's always good to have you on TVO with us tonight. Appreciate your time so much. My pleasure, Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. 
Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.